Um, in keeping with the theme of this celebration of NARF's 45th anniversary, past, present, and building the future, um, this last panel is meant to be both um, backward and forward looking um, in, in thinking about this new frontier of Native American and Indigenous peoples' rights. Um, the panel is entitled Human and Political Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Staff Attorney Heather Whiteman Runsham from NARF. Thank you, Carla. It's my pleasure to be here today. We wanted to thank CU for being so generous to host this wonderful set of presentations today. Um, we're happy to be bringing up the rear. And um, this panel is focused on the human and political rights of indigenous peoples. And that's a very broad topic and it covers a lot of ground and we're hoping to cover a lot of ground this afternoon too in a relatively short amount of time. We have a dynamite panel. We have five speakers, one of whom is still en route from DIA. So um, when she comes in <laughs> and makes her entrance, as she knows how to do, I, we might want to just applaud because it's, I mean, we're really hoping that she makes it in time to, to share her remarks with us because what she has to say is really important and is, is really a, a huge part of, of, NARF's, um, of NARF's ongoing and, and forward-looking agenda as far as the political rights of indigenous peoples go. But in the meantime, um, we're gonna start off our panel with Kim Gottschalk. And Kim is a staff attorney who joined NARF, the Native American Rights Fund, in August of 1982. Before that, he was at the law firm of Fettinger and Bloom in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and he represented the Mescalero Apache tribe. While at NARF, Kim has worked primarily on federal recognition and land claims cases, climate change, and international indigenous rights. He is also one of the members of our litigation management committee, which is responsible for directing the legal affairs of the organization. Kim received his law degree from Northwestern University, and he is admitted to practice law before the U.S. Supreme Court, the Court of Federal Claims, and the U.S. Courts of Appeal for 8th, 9th, 10th, and the District of Columbia Circuits, and in the state of New Mexico. So let's welcome Kim. Thank you, Heather. Um, I realize this is probably not a perfect analogy, but following uh, as a presenter of the distinguished colleagues that have already presented, I'm reminded of a story about the Rolling Stones oh, yeah. where they were on the same bill as uh, James Brown. And after he performed, they took a vote as to whether they should even go on or not. And one of the differences in this analogy is Heather didn't give me a vote, so <laughs> I, I guess I will proceed. <laughs> um, I, I, just as a side note, I should point out that uh, when I came to NARF in 1982, I was hired specifically as a senior attorney, an attorney with a lot of experience, eight years at that point. So <laughs> times have changed. Um, NARF has always been involved in the domestic scene, and we've always had plenty to do. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, it was felt that we needed to become involved in the international scene. And I'd just like to give a little bit of background on that. The board in 1999 approved NARF to get involved in uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Organization of American States uh, Declaration. And once we got in, I, you know, I just have to acknowledge, John, that once we get into something, you know, we, we're in all the way. And I remember in the early days saying things like, well, John, they just set a preparatory meeting in Copenhagen. And he said, well, you're gone. And so I, there's never been any restraint on that, and I really uh, appreciate that. Uh, doing the international work has been a real privilege and uh, really... Uh, mind-expanding experience. You know, there's strength in numbers, and there are, by the most common estimate, 370 or 380 million indigenous peoples in the world. And I've had uh, 
the good fortune of meeting indigenous peoples from all different parts of the world, from Asia, Africa, Latin America. Um, and it's been truly remarkable and a real privilege to, to meet these people and to be inspired by them and um, realize that there are such common interests among indigenous peoples around the world as I sit and listen to them uh, talk. It's, it really truly is amazing. Um, the, uh, the work on the declaration began uh, it, you know, it can be argued exactly when it started, but most people say 1977. And um, was fin it was agreed upon by most of the nations in the world by the year 2007. That's when it was uh, passed by the General Assembly. And it's interesting to note that from the stories I hear from people who were there at the creation, they were laughed at and thrown out of the United Nations in 1977, and within 30 years had a virtually consensus document on the rights of indigenous peoples. And as you've heard from some of the attorneys speaking here today, NARF has cases that are older than that in domestic litigation. So it's truly a remarkable achievement. Um, so I got involved in the UN Declaration, the OAS Declaration, uh, but I just want to give some background on the international arena is so large that no organization can adequately staff everything that goes on. For example, we are not involved in WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Fortunately, there is one U.S. tribe that is involved. But just to give you an example of how important this organization is, uh, one week while I was at the UN, uh, on the UN Declaration, there was a WIPO meeting going on. And in the room for the UN Declaration, there were maybe 30, 35 nations. And I just thought I'd take a walk over to WIPO. And the subject was traditional knowledge. And I walked in, and I would estimate about 175 to 180 nation states were there because indigenous peoples have very, very valuable traditional knowledge and really need to be involved in these international arena. We, we also were not involved in the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, although I think there is more of an indigenous involvement there. there there's something going on all the time. And the, the one common factor is if indigenous peoples are not there, their rights will at best be forgotten, and at worst be affirmatively undercut. So there's just no end to the work that could be done in the international arena, but there's just not, uh, not the resources to do everything that needs to be done. That said, um, oh, what, one more thing by way of background. The other interesting thing about the other indigenous peoples of the world is, they can actually be implicated by what goes on here in the United States. And a perfect example of that was a few years ago, some of you may remember that there was a, an omnibus climate change bill passed in the House of Representatives. And there's a concept that some of you may have heard of called RED, reduction of emissions due to deforestation and forest degradation. And the idea is you reduce you have to reduce deforestation or you can't stay within even the two degrees that Don Wharton was talking about earlier, much less 1.5 degrees. And so the, the idea of RED is to pay people not to cut down timber. And that's mostly in the Southern Hemisphere. And guess where most of that for, those forests are? It's on indigenous lands, whether recognized or not. And so there were provisions in this U.S. legislation about RED and how it would be carried out. And of course, the concern then was for the rights of the indigenous peoples. Well, how were they going to come to the United States and lobby in the U.S. Congress? And so it became incumbent upon us to lobby in the U.S. Congress for what was basically the rights of other indigenous peoples around the world. So everything is very much interconnected. Okay, um, 
So for my presentation, um, I had my law clerk, Ansley, uh, help me out on a, on a PowerPoint, and I told her I wanted a PowerPoint that was wildly entertaining and deeply informative. So if it's not, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, my, my, my presentation is pretty simple and straightforward, and um, it's not at all original, I don't think. It's, these ideas are out there, but I think they're important enough that they bear repeating and maybe thinking about. I, you know, the, the issue with the declaration now is how does it get implemented, and there's all kinds of useful things like, you know, getting the U.S. to have their agencies review policies to see if they're consistent with the declaration and so on and so forth, and that, that's all very valuable. But another way of doing it is organically through, through the development of case law. It's a really, it's, it's a two-edged sword because if you don't choose wisely and make good decisions, of course, you could have, you could have some really bad results that we'll live with for a long time, but the hope is that if you're strategic and make use of the UN Declaration, uh, maybe you'll get a court to mention it in a positive way in a, in a certain context, and it can be built on from there. And so the theme of, of what I'm going to talk about starts basically with the proposition uh, that Felix Cohen set forth here, that our Indian law originated and can still be most clearly grasped as a branch of international law. And I'm going to question whether it's still most easily grasped that way, but argue that it should be. It is certainly true that federal Indian law is rooted in international law principles, but over time, federal law has been domesticated, primarily under the Commerce Clause, and has lost its connections with developments in international law. And the thesis is that U.S law would benefit from synchronization with recent international law developments in indigenous rights. And of course, the most prominent example of that is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So the, uh, if you remember, those of you who have had Indian law, the Kagamak case, the court went through the different possible sources of authority and basically couldn't find any. And so they said, well, somebody's got to do it. And uh, deal, that is dealing with, the, with Indians and that dealt specifically with the Major Crimes Act. And so they just found that they had authority to do it. And that actually, in a way, is an international concept. We talk about the federal uh, government being a government of limited powers and enumerated powers, but there's Supreme Court case law which says that only applies in the domestic arena and in the international arena if something comes up that you need to do internationally well you can do it because you're an international sovereign but someone mentioned earlier the cotton petroleum case and there they say very clearly that the central function of the Indian Commerce Clause is to provide Congress with plenary power to legislate in the field of Indian Affairs now, plenary power, I think, probably has at least two aspects. One is it's broad enough so that the federal government can deal with everything they need to deal with. But in its more insidious aspect, it means basically Congress can do whatever it wants. And that, to me, is where international law could really uh, play a beneficial role. So I, I've kind of gone through and just picked a few issues. You could, you could go through the declaration and find many, many issues where U.S. law falls short. Um, I've picked three that I'm going to discuss, um, and mostly I'm just going to show you the juxtaposition of what we say in U.S. law and what the Declaration says, and you can kind of get the gist of how our thinking needs to change about, about these matters. And I want to quote from... Uh, the case of Roper versus Simmons, which dealt with the uh, question of whether you could have 
a death penalty for, for uh, people under 18 years of age. And the court struck that down. And the U.S. shares the distinction, if that's what you call it, of being the only country in the world other than Somalia, which is not a party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. But the case was struck down, and the court said an interesting thing, that the, the, it referred to the necessity of referring to the, quote, evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. So I would submit that in large respect, at a minimum, the UN Declaration is a sign of those evolving standards of decency to which we should turn. So juxtaposition, here's, here's Article 2. Indigenous peoples and individuals are free and equal to all other peoples and individuals and have the right to be free from any kind of discrimination in the exercise of their rights, in particular that based on their indigenous origin or entity. So that's the UN standard. Here's United States versus Lara. The Indian Commerce Clause gives Congress plenary power to constrain tribal autonomy and even terminate the existence of individual tribes. I mean, I guess to me it's amazing that the court could write that and not have second thoughts. Seems a little bit like genocide. Um, but to tie it into what Arlinda said this morning, what's interesting is the case they cite, they cite a couple cases, but the next citation is to United States versus Holiday for the proposition that if the political branches recognize a tribe, then we must too. Well, wait a minute. As Arlinda very clearly said, and she's totally right, whether a tribe exists or not does not depend upon federal recognition. And so the Supreme Court, in citing Holiday, is not even correctly reading the law. It's, it's mistakenly thinking that tribal existence depends on on recognition from the federal government, which is totally false. Article 3. This was a, an article that was, it was a red line for indigenous peoples. Uh, the document was not going to be bought into by indigenous peoples without this provision. Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status, and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Now, there's a lot of debate about among the countries what that means, the United States, when they endorse the Declaration, uh, albeit, you know, somewhat after the fact, issued a 15-page single-spaced explanation of what they thought they were doing. And one of the things they said they're doing is that this is not the same right of self-determination as is contained in Article I of the International Civil and Political Covenant that says all peoples have the right of self-determination. But the language is the same, and of course our position is that the rights are the same. But be that as it may, in the case of Washington versus Confederated Band and Tribes of the Yakima Indian Reservation, the state of Washington, acting pursuant to Public Law 280, adopted, assumed jurisdiction over the tribe. But it didn't assume jurisdiction fully. It picked, and it, it, you know, it, it picked some areas and left out other areas. And the tribe said, you can't do that. And not only that, since you're touching on a fundamental right of ours to self-government, the law is subject to strict scrutiny under the equal protection component of the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment. The reason they're looking to that is because the law was authorized by the federal government. What is the response to that? The contention that a law that diminishes tribal sovereignty abridges a fundamental right is untenable. Well, that's interesting since now 150 nations at least agree 
that indigenous peoples have the right of self-determination. I would argue that if anybody comes, inherits a case where this might be an issue, it's time to revisit the question of whether the tribal right to self-determination is a fundamental right subject to strict scrutiny. Okay, 46.2 of the Declaration. The exercise of the rights set forth in this Declaration shall be subject only to such limitations as are determined by law and in accordance with international human rights obligations. Any such limitations shall be non-discriminatory and strictly necessary solely for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others and for meeting the just and most compelling requirements of a democratic society. Juxtaposition, the Indian Commerce Clause grants Congress authority to limit Indian tribes' sovereign powers. It is well established that Congress, in the exercise of its plenary power over Indian affairs, may restrict the retained sovereign powers of an Indian tribe. Imagine if Congress had to live with that. It's quite a difference. And like I say, this was a fairly idiosyncratic choice of, of provisions that just, to me, uh, are really out of sync with the way things should be. And what I urge people is to, attorneys, when you're thinking about making your arguments, to think about how you might use the Declaration in strategic ways. And personally, I try to never use plenary power in a brief that I write. It's a small gesture, but for example, you saw the quote from Lara. Why was plenary power necessary to be briefed in Lara? If the Duro fix at issue in Lara was constitutional common law, well, we had a huge problem anyway. If it were a declaration of common law, it is totally unremarkable that Congress can change that. And I understand that attorneys want to say, well, plenary power is used against us enough times. We want to make sure that you know, we can use it to support the idea of, of the Duro fix. But I would submit that it wasn't necessary uh, because it was clearly within Congress's power to, uh, to enact the Duro fix. So I just hope uh, people will give some thought to uh, how the Declaration might be used. There are many more ways than what I've covered here today, but that's all I have to say. All right. Panelist will be Walter Echohawk. Walter Echohawk is the inaugural Walter R. Echohawk Distinguished Visiting Scholar. I think he might be the first person I know who taught it his own, the first to be the first in a chair named after him or a visiting skull. It says, <laughs> that says a lot. It, it really does, and, and you know, congratulations. He is the author of In the Light of Justice, The Rise of Human Rights in Native America and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2013. And in the Courts of the Conqueror, the 10 worst Indian law cases ever decided in 2010, and Battlefields and Burial Grounds in 1994. Walter is a Pawnee Indian with a bachelor's in political science from Oklahoma State University and a Juris Doctorate from the University of New Mexico in 1973. In his home state of Oklahoma, Walter wears three hats, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the Kickapoo Tribe, of counsel to the firm of Crow and Dunleavy, Oklahoma's oldest and largest law firm, and adjunct professor at the University of Tulsa College of Law. When he is, during, during his time at the Native American Rights Fund from 1973 through 2009, he represented tribes, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians on significant issues in the modern era of federal Indian law during the rise of modern Indian nations in the tribal sovereignty movement. He litigated indigenous rights pertaining to religious freedom, prisoners' rights, water rights, treaty rights, and reburial repatriation rights. Um, he is admitted to practice law before the Supreme Court of the United States, the Colorado Supreme Court, the Oklahoma Supreme Court, and various courts of appeals, federal claims court, and a number of U.S. district courts. So let's welcome Walter. Thank you, Heather. 
And good afternoon, Noah, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I think that all uh, paths do lead to Boulder, uh, if you're concerned with federal Indian law. And uh, I'm very glad to be back. And um, I want to commend and congratulate NARF on their 45th anniversary, and uh, John and all of the staff attorneys and the staff, you know, and uh, wish many, many more happy uh, years in the, in the decades ahead. My topic uh, this afternoon is the human rights era of federal Indian law, the next 45 years. And in your materials, I have uh, included a paper on this topic that uh, I wrote that was published last spring in the FBA's uh, Federal Lawyer magazine. And so I just want to try to hit the highlights of that uh, up here and invite you to read it at your leisure. And uh, <coughs> I have to uh, begin by acknowledging two great ladies here, up here against the wall, uh, Ada Deer and Suzanne Harjo. Um, it's very good to see you, and these, these ladies have been very, very important uh, to our people uh, during our tribal sovereignty movement, and I'm very, uh, very honored and, and glad to see you here. And I want to uh, devote my uh, remarks, if I may, uh, this afternoon to the late Bob Paraguay, who uh, passed away just a couple, um, uh, about a month or two ago. He was one of the toughest, hardest fighting uh, NARF staff attorneys of all time. And, um, you know, he, I, w I was very pleased to work at his side. I did, I think, some of my finest work with Robert Paraguay. And so I wanted to acknowledge him and, and um, uh, for these, my remarks today. But uh, here on the 45th anniversary of NARF, it is good to reflect on our past work, but I want to focus my remarks on the future of NARF's work in the next 45 years. And I will pose the question to you, what is the future of federal Indian law? And where do we go from here? And I know that most attorneys uh, uh, work, do their work on word processors, but me, uh, for myself, I use a crystal ball in my work. <laughs> and I also consult my oracle. And so before I came up here, I looked into my crystal ball and, and saw at least the first, the next 40 years. It got kind of cloudy after that. <laughs> But I want to tell you what I saw. Um, and um, my crystal ball sees that in the next 40 years, in the, the 21st century Indian law practitioner will work in three big areas. Uh, the first area is to consolidate the gains made by Indian nations over the past 45 years. The second is to help those Indian nations that have uh, now find themselves in new territory to navigate those uncharted waters. And then the third big area is to reform and strengthen federal Indian law to make it a more just body of law. And I think these first two tasks are the grist of tribal attorneys, attorneys that are, have a very firm grip on our existing legal framework of federal Indian law. But this third area, reforming and strengthening federal Indian law, it seems to me is the role of our public interest attorneys, such as the Native American Rights Fund, our legal theorists that inhabit the law schools, uh, along with scholars in Indian country, Native American study programs, and above all, I think, tribal leaders in the next 45 years, leaders with a big vision. And um, <clears throat> the thrust of my presentation this afternoon is to, 
address this law reform task that I think sits before us. And so I want to cover, in the time that I have, three areas with you. First of all, and this is by way of recapping my article that's in your material, but firstly, I want to look at how we got here after the formative years in the modern and postmodern eras of federal Indian law. Secondly, I want to identify, at least for me, some deeply ingrained problems in the current legal framework that I think need fixing in the 21st century to advance self-determination and indigenous rights. And then thirdly, I'd like to talk about the advent of this human rights era in federal Indian law and policy that was ushered in by President Obama in the year 2010 with the president's endorsement of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And in my talk um, uh, about what I saw in my crystal ball with regard to these three areas, I want to lay out at the beginning four premises that I have that I'm going to advance uh, for you. And my first premise is that the Indian self-determination uh, era has advanced almost as far as it can go under our existing legal framework uh, that's provided by the extant uh, body of federal Indian law and policy. We've ridden this pony as far as it can take us. And so today, after 45 years, we look around Indian country, and what you see is basically what, what we're going to get. The second premise that I have is that any future significant advances of our people depends on proactively changing this domestic legal framework by reforming federal Indian law, strengthening it, and making it a more just and dependable body of law. And that task is what lawyers know is as large-scale strategic law development. And I think that's the challenge of our public interest legal sector in Indian country. Strategic law development to reform our existing legal framework and make it more just and dependable. Um, my third premise is that I predict that having come as far as it can go, this Indian self-determination era will draw to a close very shortly in favor of a brand new paradigm for protecting indigenous rights in the United States. And here I refer to the rise of a human rights era. And I contend that today is a historic moment. Our scholars say it's a jurisgenerative moment, a lawmaking moment, because we stand at the crossroads now between two legal frameworks for defining Native American rights. Federal Indian law, which is our existing legal framework, and now we can see on the horizon a brand new human rights framework. This human rights framework comes to us from modern international human rights law. And it sees our legal rights that all we've been talking about all day as inherent human rights, a very special category of legal rights that are inalienable. They're indefeasible, indivisible rights, a very strong foundation for all of our Native American aspirations. And I think that the challenge of our litigators, of our law professors, of our legal theorists, and our tribal leaders in this new era uh, 
is to merge the very best protective features from our existing legal framework with this new human rights framework to create a new and seamless uh, framework for Native American rights. Using this framework that's provided by the UN Declaration that Kim talked about. And I think that the goal of this new human rights era is to embed Native American rights into our legal culture as inherent human rights. For only inviolate, indefeasible, and inalienable rights can safely secure the situation of Native Americans as a vulnerable minority in our body politic and our nation with the full measure of our indigenous rights intact. So with these premises, uh, let me move to my first task. How did we get here in so far as our legal activism since 1970? If we look back to that historic year when NARF was founded uh, in Boulder here, President Nixon in that summer articulated the Indian self-determination policy. That was a brand new policy of that day. It was the crowning victory of our Native American advocates, the late Vine Deloria, uh, Clyde Warrior, and, and others uh, who were trying to coax the government away from its policies of termination, enforced assimilation, towards a more enlightened Indian policy of self-determination. And um, the task at that time was to implement that policy. And that's, that, that was the work of the Native American Rights Fund as the legal prong of the tribal sovereignty movement. Today, 45 years later, we can see the fruits of that labor all around us in, in Indian country. It was the, an implementation task because that policy was not enforceable by any courts. It remained to be implemented. And it became the work of two generations through litigation, through agency change, through uh, legislation. And that resulted in uh, uh, basically taking the existing legal framework that we had at that time. We didn't create it. It was handed down to us back in 1970, the early years. Our, our strategy there was simply to try to make the best of the existing framework, to coax the courts to, to uh, enforce the most protective features that could be found within that legal framework and live with the dark side of that framework. And that was our strategy. It seemed to work well until the, the uh, Rehnquist court uh, kind of undercut that strategy. But that was basically the, 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 the legal strategy. We took the framework as we found it. We tried to coax the courts into enforcing the most protective features, the inherent tribal sovereignty doctrine, the protectorate uh, relationship discussed in the Wooster case, our treaties, and then just simply uh, lived with the dark side of, of federal Indian law as we found it in 1970. And I think we've come a long ways using that strategy. I think it's dangerous these days to uh, litigate before the Supreme Court. Uh, but we have witnessed, on the one hand, I think the rise of our modern uh, Indian nations, as Professor Wilkinson has so beautifully described it. But I would submit that I think we've stalled out in our progress at the very doorsteps of self-determination as that uh, human rights uh, principle is now defined by federal Indian law. And, we, and we've got some problems in our existing legal framework that bar the door to entering the realm of 
of, uh, of uh, this human rights realm that is currently taking place in, in modern international human rights law. Um, there are some anti-indigenous features that Kim alluded to up here on the screen um, that uh, uh, we can see in our existing uh, uh, legal framework. We have the Supreme Court now since the mid-80s in the postmodern era on an, a judicial trend towards trimming back on our hard-won rights. We have an 80% loss rate before the U.S. Supreme Court, our Indian nations. And our scholars have identified some anti-indigenous features and functions in the dark side of federal Indian law, i.e. the law of colonialism that was embedded into our legal framework. The 1800s is doctrine of discovery judicial myths of conquest, notions of race and racism, of cultural superiority, unfettered guardianship, plenary power. This dark side of the law has created some inherent tensions in our existing legal framework that have to be resolved. We can't, on the one hand, be a self-determinating people, a self-determining people with self-government, while being hostage, on the other hand, to plenary power, as Kim pointed out. The two political conditions are mutually inconsistent. And we have a war that's going on within our existing legal framework between the protective features, which are very vibrant, and this dark side, which uh, strives to undermine that regime. I think that our existing framework, fighting as hard as we, we do as attorneys, uh, it does need a lifeline. And I think that lifeline can be seen in this human rights framework that is now provided to us. And as we look at this new framework, we we can look back at federal Indian law and we can see that our framework is bereft of the human rights principle. All of our foundational cases expressly eschew looking at abstract questions of justice or getting involved in debates and morality when defining our rights. It has insisted that Justice has no place in our legal framework. And so it has evolved a very odd, amoral uh, body of law. You cannot find any human rights precepts, any judicial discourse on human rights, any principles in that body of law. And I think that accounts on the high tolerance that we see for these manifestly unjust uh, uh, court opinions that populate our legal framework. And that has produced some very troubling end products, this existing legal system. Kim has alluded to one, our Indian self-determination is not seen as a human right, as it is in modern international human rights law. And we can go down the list and see that we have many, many gaps between our existing uh, law and policy that we teach and that we practice and these minimum human rights standards. We can identify these gaps. It's the work of this generation to close those gaps. And I think that we do that, as Kim alluded to, by large-scale strategic law development, just like uh, NAACP Defense Fund did in overturning Plessy v. Ferguson. 58 years it took them to change that unjust uh, legal framework through strategic law development. They got a new framework with Brown v. Board of Education, equality under the law. That's the kind of work that we need 
to lead our people into this human rights realm where we can enjoy a stronger, more just, and more reliable and dependable rights. And so I think that uh, the Native American Rights Fund and the CU Law School here, all of our practitioners here, tribal leaders as well, you know, that's, that's the challenge I think that sits before us. Thank you. And everybody applauded just in time for Natalie's grand entrance. We're really happy that you made it. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, listening to Kim and, um, and Walter's discussions, I was reminded of a Vine Deloria quote. Western civilization, unfortunately, does not link knowledge and morality. Rather, it connects knowledge and power and makes them equivalent. And what we're really talking about today is how we change that equivocation of power and morality to one of knowledge and morality. So we've had two discussions so far that talk broadly about where we'd like to see federal Indian law, indigenous law, the, and our ability to assert and protect our rights as indigenous peoples, um, where we see that going for, in a forward-looking fashion. So our next three presentations are going to talk more specifically about work that's being done on the ground, sort of case studies of, of ways that this can happen. And our first presenter in this portion of the panel will be Brett Shaw. <coughs> Brett is a member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and also has Itazipko, Lakota, and Cheyenne ancestors. I'm sorry if I said that with a Crow accent, Brett. <laughs> His work at NARF focuses on indigenous peacemaking initiatives, boarding schools, and sacred places. Brett has experience representing and advising tribal governments, agencies, and enterprises in general governmental health and human services, employment, natural resources, construction, economic and business development, business development matters, as well as contributing legal advice and litigation support for a number of private individuals, businesses and development initiatives. Um, interestingly, this is Brett's third round at NARF as, as a NARF staffer. He has worked before as a research attorney and was also a law clerk during law school. Um, he received his law degree from Stanford University and also has a Master of Arts from the University of Kansas. So let's welcome Brett to the podium. Hang on just a sec, I've got to get to my PowerPoint. Um, first time I said it's, it's pretty humbling speaking here today. I mean, as maybe the career path that I've chosen, uh, as described by Heather, indicates, I'm, I'm pretty appreciative of NARF, and I always have been since I heard about them. And um, to follow Bunky and Kim on a panel is, is really something else. It, it's, you know, I guess I have the right to call them colleagues, but they've really been more like mentors for most of my career, as is the case with a lot of people who have spoken today and a lot of people in the audience who didn't speak too. So. Um, but I'm pretty excited to talk about a case study in human rights, especially after those previous two talks. This is something that NARF had the foresight to become involved in at least as early as 2011 when a, when a symposium was held here at CU in conjunction with the law school here and the University of Wyoming and the boarding school healing project of the seventh generation fund. And I think Don Wharton was, was the main instigator of that on the NARF side. Um, to talk about the boarding schools. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about the boarding schools today, that's a whole nother talk, and, and we usually spend a half an hour to an hour talking about the history of the boarding schools and, and what all went wrong, but there is some stuff that we can pick up on, and it fits into the context of what we've been talking about today. And uh, it shows how NARF, even in 2011, was looking towards the future at some of these uh, innovations that need to happen going forward for the next 45 years. The, the self-determination policy in the early 70s um, and the UNDRIP developments, the, the, the international developments over the past decade or so, to, to a large extent have been prospective fixes. In other words, there were problems in the ways that the United States and other countries dealt with natives. Um, and they set up systems that were basically designed to serve what, a, a resource grab? Um, they were systems that basically focused on termination, extermination of a people, 
When that wasn't so cool anymore, they decided to do cultural genocide instead because then the people stay alive, kill the Indian or, in order to save the man. That's a flawed system when, when, when those are the, the legs that you're standing on, right? So uh, self-determination and, and the international arena developments were fixes to that. But the problem is they were fixes to that system moving forward. In the meantime, we spent a couple centuries uh, under the system that was flawed in its development. And so we have other residual harms that still haven't been dealt with. Uh, those harms include historic trauma, lost cultures, lost language, lost abilities to support life, your, to support yourself, basically, the way that your people would know how. Um, some of that you can go after um, with property law, or you know, try to try to get land back and so on, try to fix legislation so that you have better access and so on. But some of these other things, historic trauma, lost culture, lost language, we don't quite have the legal tools to get there yet. Um, but we need to get there, too. Um, it turns out that when children experienced what they did in boarding schools, um, those were adverse childhood experiences. And since then, the fields of psychology and sociology have started to recognize that adverse childhood experiences, such as what our ancestors experienced, were really harmful and harmful long term. You start to see the, and, and so there have been studies now that connect these defined adverse uh, childhood experiences that are listed up here. Um, with negative outcomes in life. So you look at the pyramid, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, um, adoption of health risk behaviors, disease, disability, and social problems, and early death, in fact. Um, these defined things, the more, the more checks that you can put next to this list in, in each child's uh, lifetime as they grow up, the more likely they are to have those negative consequences. Well, you look at these lists, if, if you come from a tribal community or when you end up working in one, these start to look pretty familiar, and it's time to do something about that. Of course, uh, people have been doing stuff about it in our communities all along, but it's time for the federal government and other parties to, to step up and help with that, too. Um, the adverse childhood experiences have been linked in studies to health risks. This list of health risks, risks might look pretty familiar to those of you who have uh, connections in Indian country, alcoholism and alcohol abuse, uh, cardiopulmonary diseases, depression, fetal death, health-related health quality of life issues, drug use, heart disease, liver disease, all sorts of stuff. It all comes down to the bottom line on the right there. Earlier death is where a lot of most of them actually lead, all pointing back to the adverse childhood experiences. Um, there's also been identified in recent years uh, a battery of adverse adult experiences, such as living in poverty, living in unemployment, living with violence all around you, homicide around you, witnessing assault, witnessing traumatic, other traumatic events, and facing high rates of discrimination. This has been found to lead to things like substance abuse in order to numb the pain, other self-destructive behaviors, suicidal thoughts and gestures, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, anger, difficulty recognizing and expressing emotions. Um, all of that still might look pretty familiar, right? And these are, these are adult things. Uh, if you experience these in adulthood, then you have those negative uh, experiences. Now, there's certain um, characteristics that families might develop that can lead to passing on of trauma across generations. And um, some of these that have been pointed out in the literature include shame or a shame-bound regime, which I'll talk about a little bit more, traumatic bonding, trauma reenactment, anxiety, hypervigilance, depression. Um, I won't go into detail on all of these because I just don't have time. but. Um, when somebody experiences a trauma, they can pick up these characteristics or pick up these ways of acting and then pass that trauma on or pass uh, negative consequences on to other people in their family. So as one example that may be kind of interesting to lawyers, <laughs> um, the shame-bound regime, um, that can include being in control of all behaviors and, in, and interactions. So somebody being in control of all, all behaviors and interactions. Um, I know sometimes some of us lawyers are a little bit controlling about stuff. Sometimes it's profession, professional uh, responsibility, and other times maybe some of us go over the, <laughs> go over the line a little bit. My, I've been guilty of that a few times. Um, demanding perfection, always being right and doing things right. Um, is there a reason for all the lawyer jokes? <laughs> Could it be this, these sort of personality traits? But actually these are, these are um, <laughs> characteristics that you see in, basic, in what's called a shame-bound regime that, that can develop in a family when somebody's experienced a trauma and not and not dealt with healing that trauma. Read that as when our grandparents went to boarding schools, and this list looks a lot like some of our grandparents, um, 
this may be what happens in your family. And this, this leads to passing on some of the negative characteristics or some of the negative experiences still. Um, blaming others or yourself if something doesn't go as planned. Denying feelings, especially denying loneliness and grief. Having expectations of unreliability in relationships. Not speaking openly about shameful or compulsive behavior. No bringing closure or completeness to transactions. Denying, disqualifying, disguising behavior that's either disrespectful or abusive or shameful. Just kind of not talking about it, not calling people out on something when they don't behave right. Um, some of that might look familiar. Actually, there's, there's three ways that trauma can be transferred across generations. Um, psychological, physiological, and social. Um, with psychological transfer, that's usually, uh, there's, there's certain results of chronic childhood stress that will lead to, to the transfer of the trauma to the next generation. Um, what that looks like, according to the science, is learning disabilities, aggression against yourself and others, lack of a capacity for self-regulation. In other words, your emotions really get to you and you can't quite control them when you should be able to control them. Um, hypervigilance, hypervigilance is kind of that always on the lookout for the next bad thing, always having to live on edge. Um, difficulty adopting your behavior to social norms, in, including reading social cues. Um, developmental delays in, in all sorts of, of uh, spheres. And um, part of this is a result of hippo damage to the part of the brain called the hippocampus. And that can impact the learning and the memory of, of children if they experience that damage. And that damage can be triggered by just the mix of chemicals in the body as the, as the, the body reacts to stress that a child faces. The physiological transfer of trauma is uh, really interesting and it's kind of a hot topic in science right now. Um, certain hormones in your, in your brain and blood system are released when you're under stress. It generally leads you to do the flight or flight, flight, fight or flight syndrome or freeze or whatever, you know, that you can feel your adrenaline pumping and so on. Um, what happens is the chemistry in your blood changes as, as a tool to help you to get away or play possum or, or whatever it is, whatever your reaction to the stressor is. The problem is if, if you experience that chronically, then receptors for those chemicals in your brain regulate differently. They get used to that high level of, the, of those certain chemicals in your blood. It makes a change in what's ready to, to be read out of your blood in your brain. Well, if a mother has that kind of different blood chemistry going on, guess what happens to the baby that's in utero? The baby's also born with basically upregulated receptors of a certain sort that can lead it to even though it hasn't experienced that stress yet, it can be born as though it has experienced all the stress that the mother had. Um, so that'd be physiological transfer of the trauma. Um, I, I put in your materials, cortisol is one example. That's a, that's a well-known stress blood chemical. It has its uses, but you don't want to go around with too much cortisol in your blood all the time. And in fact, you can, you can pass that on. Um, the, the case for maternal transmission of trauma via physiological means, like I just described from the mother to the child in utero, is pretty clear. There's other fascinating stuff going on in science. There's one study that's shown paternal transmission in mice, too. So in other words, they took a, a calm mama mouse and a stressed out dad mouse, and somehow the babies that mom had with dad exhibited that, that upregulated brain chemistry stuff going on. That's, I have no clue how that happens. I, you know, We'll see. Um, I suppose they got to do more tests and, and so on, but the, just the fact that it can cross generations paternally somehow says there's an awful lot going on that we can't even understand so far. Then finally, the social transfer of trauma. Um, in boarding schools, the goal was cultural eradication, um, cultural genocide, we call it what it is at NARP, which I'm, I'm glad for. The goal was to kill the Indian in order to save the man. That was the stated goal. And my PowerPoint got kind of messed up, but this last point on the left side is, yet the culture for people, for kids that went to the boarding schools could have served as a buffer to the negative experiences that they had when they, when they were taken away from their homes, when they're you know, trying to speak a language that they are forced to speak a language that they didn't necessarily even know, and, and all of that stress. If, if they were able to, to resort to their cultural means, then that would have served as a buffer and helped them be able to better um, deal with the stressors of going to a school somewhere. So if your goal was really to educate them, then you could have let them have the buffering uh, culture, cultural elements that, that would have helped them make it through what would have been a naturally stressful process. Um, 
the post boarding school model might be might be best seen as one of social transmittal of historical trauma. You have basically adverse childhood experiences by, uh, by the children who had to go to boarding school, led to development of poor self esteem, negative coping mechanisms, negative cognitive styles. Um, that would lead to increased stress. It would lead to poor mental health, increased reactivity to stressors. In other words, it's too easy to get stressed out. Um, that would lead to parenting deficits, which would lead to adverse childhood experiences for the next generation, and so on. I mean, it can be, it could even be a snowballing effect, and, and the seeds could have been planted in the boarding school era, and probably in a lot of our families they were. Um, socially, other factors can compound, can compound what was experienced. You get, you get the, uh, the adult stressing factors too, discrimination, poverty, inadequate housing and so on. All of that stuff just kind of adds to the pressure. You get a lot of oppression and you get lateral acting out of, of the oppression. Um, with all of that in mind, I mean, the point is there was real harms that were made and those harms haven't been dealt with yet. And we're still dealing with them um, in our communities, in our families. Now there's hindrances to legal remedies within the existing framework. So when we start talking about a new era of human rights law, I start to get a little bit fired up because that's where we need to go. The system that we're dealing with now is largely in the way of, of the kind of healing that we need. Um, if we're talking about the boarding schools, one of the hindrances is sovereign immunity, right? We'd be having to sue the United States in a lot of cases because that's who set up the boarding schools. Um, statutes of limitations are another issue. Um, since, since the early 1970s, tribes have been running schools more, and so the United States and the churches who were complicit in this have kind of washed their hands for the most part. Um, and so we're dealing with stuff that's 40 years old and older, and that's, that's a lot longer than most statutes of limitations. Even if you can get around the statutes of limitations, you face political resistance. So for example, in South Dakota, some cases where some uh, people in charge of children, some priests in charge of children at boarding schools, uh, those cases were moving forward. Maybe those people would have been able to, to actually get a lawsuit and get some money damages. Um, they got around the statute of limitations because the law in South Dakota was such that you didn't have, you didn't start tolling the statute. In other words, the clock didn't start running until you realized that you had been harmed. And with, with something like being molested, sometimes you might repress that memory. And so the memory didn't come up until somebody was, say, 40 years old. It's like, oh man, guess what happened? Guess what that priest did to me? You might have a chance to get a lawsuit in from that point going forward if the statute was, say, five years. But if it was a 20-year you know, statute, maybe it happened four years ago, you couldn't get the suit. So anyway, some suits were moving forward in South Dakota. The Catholic Church was so powerful in South Dakota, it just pressured the legislature and got the law changed so that the statute of limitations tolling thing didn't apply in these cases. Basically, took the cases away, protected the church from having to pay damages. Um, so political resistance is another hindrance uh, within our current system to legal remedies for people. Um, Lost evidence, uh, the churches and the governments were in charge of the schools. Sometimes it's just aged out, other times they've probably gotten rid of, of incriminating evidence. Um, and another one would be proximate causation for harms across generations. When I'm talking about um, historical trauma being passed on in families, you're gonna have a tough time proving that somebody today, say a child today, is actually experiencing harm that was proximately caused anyway from a legal standpoint by something that happened to their great-grandparents. Right? That's gonna be a tough case to make, uh, probably impossible. So all of these kind of things get in the way of us uh, really getting some sort, of, some sort of resolution for the harms that were done by the boarding schools that we continue to live with. In other words, where is the hope is where we end up and, and where the hope lies is really in healing. Um, and so that's what we've been moving for with this project. There's a few levels at which healing can occur. I think we should look at each of them and come up with strategies for each of them. Can heal at an individual level. Families also need to heal because we deal with each other and so on. Probably makes sense to the natives in here. That's part of the native way of seeing things. Um, also on a community level, a tribal level, a pan-tribal or a Indian country kind of a level. And then the United States needs to heal too because the perpetrator's harmed when they perpetrate against somebody. When they harm somebody else, they're harmed in a way. Um, so uh, we'll just do a real quick view at some of the healing. On the family level, there's some hopeful developments going on in psychology. Here's a snippet from um, the CDC, their webpage, where they talk about positive relationship factors can help break the cycle of child maltreatment. There's people doing work in the field that can be helpful. Um, so there's, there's good work going on. At the community and tribal nation levels, there's some healing that can go on. And I think what we really need to do is
look at undoing what was harmful in the first place. Um, the boarding schools taught people to be ashamed of being native, um, and they taught and they tried to break apart our social webs, our, our network. And so people lost self-esteem. They lost that sense of a place of belonging. And in fact, those are protective factors against negative things. If you talk to psychologists, child psychologists, uh, self-esteem and, and a feeling of belonging are really important insulating factors against all sorts of stressors. So we try to revive that in, in children and in people and in, in adults. You have cases like adopted out native adults who are coming back to their tribe and being welcomed in warmly and that feels good to them. All, all these sorts of things about reunifying. Um, Tribal languages and tribal cultures seem to be really key in, in healing at the community level. Places where tribes bring their culture back alive or where they try to re-implement their language or recover their language as much as they can. Um, that's, uh, that's leading to a lot of healing in these kind of group, these community and, and tribal nation levels. Looking at the pan-tribal in the United States and churches and, and ways that healing can happen, um, we basically it come to the uh, to the point that where significant trauma has taken place from genocide and other atrocities, there's minimal steps that have to be done in order to, to uh, support the healing and reconciliation that needs to happen. This is a sort of thing where we can look all around the country at, at rec movements of reconciliation for guidance and, and support. We can look to Canada, we can look to Africa. Um, one of the universal steps is acknowledging the wrong. That validates and accepts the, it, uh, it validates the experience of the victims, and it also starts to show an acceptance of responsibility by the perpetrator. Um, Offering a meaningful, and acceptance, a meaningful acceptance of responsibility could include an apology, it might or might not. Most people will say that the apology actually helps the perpetrator. Um, it's something that helps them to move towards healing, uh, not so much as a victim. Sometimes from the victim standpoint, you can't ever, be, you can't ever apologize for something. That, all you can do is forgive and move on. Um, and then undertake affirmative steps to rectify the wrong through appropriate reconciliation moves. Um, Looking at pan-tribal again, pan-tribal healing in the United States and churches, we can look to my esteemed colleague's book where he said that we can make amends to Native America and discourse is the first step, talking about it, in other words. Um, if performed willingly and honestly, atoning acknowledges the harm and grief of the victim that if not dealt with, often leads to a wider cycle of revenge in communities. Anger and shame are open wounds that can fester for decades, so there's a case for why one ought to pursue this now, moving forward. Things aren't getting any better. Um, there's several action steps that we can consider at a federal level, and that's where we could put some effort and where we have been. Um, we can recognize that the boarding school policy of cultural genocide was wrong. Um, acknowledge the role of the federal government and the churches in, in initiating and implementing that policy, just basically a taking of responsibility. Um, the United States and the churches can offer an appropriate and meaningful acceptance of responsibility, which might include an apology, like we talked about. Um, the, at the federal level, action could be taken to provide or support the provision of financial support for community-directed healing programs, help communities to heal in whatever way it is that they needed to heal. Um, we could take action to document or support the documentation of the scope and depth of the problem through a congressionally authorized study and report on the boarding school policy. We all have family stories in, in Indian country about boarding schools. We don't know the full extent. We know that kids didn't ever come back. Some of them never came back. Some came back sick and died. Some came back thriving and happy. Some came back scarred and never the same. So, you know, what, what all happened? What kids went where? All of that stuff. It, it should be documented because it's part of the truth and we can't deal with it until we know what the truth is. Um, on the federal level, they can also support the rescue and restoration of native languages, start to undo what was, what was intentionally done before, and um, support for education about what happened. In a healing sense, I would say thank you, or Wopila in Lakota. Um, they're again reviving tribal languages. Wopila is basically, there's a state of honor that you've given me by letting me talk in front of you. So, so Wopila, there's contact info in your, in your packets if you need it. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Brett. Our next panelist is Melody, Mc, uh, Melody McKenzie, and Melody is the professor and director of the Kahuli Au Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law at the William S. Richardson School of Law in Hawaii, at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. Prior to attending law school, she was a staff member at the Native American Rights Fund where she helped to start the National Indian Law Library. 
And inspired by the work of NARS attorneys, she decided to go to law school to work for the Native Hawaiian community, graduated from the University of Hawaii School of Law, and served as a law clerk to the Chief Justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court, Justice William S. Richardson. Um, prior, um, after that, she joined the staff of the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation, which is a public interest law firm that protects and advances the rights of Native Hawaiians. She has worked on cases asserting Native Hawaiian traditional and customary rights, dealing with quiet title and land issues, defending the constitutionality of Native Hawaiian programs, and she currently teaches Native Hawaiian rights, federal Indian law, and legal writing courses. She's widely published. Um, most recently, um, was the editor-in-chief of Native Hawaiian law, a treatise, which is the seminal work on indigenous Hawaiian legal issues. And she is also one of the contributing authors to the Cohen Handbook, on federal Indian law, and she was awarded in 2013 University of Hawaii's Regents Medal for Excellence in Teaching. Welcome, Melody. Aloha, thank you so much for inviting me. I feel somewhat like coming home um, as um, was mentioned, I did work for NARF before I went to law school, and it was really the work of NARF that, and its attorneys that inspired me to go to law school and to go back home to Hawaii to work for the Native Hawaiian community. Um, today I wanna to talk a little bit about what's happening in our community and, and kind of relate it to the um, international human rights issues that particularly um, Walter Echohawk spoke about, but in a probably slightly context, a uh, different context than he might have meant. Um, the title of my talk is called In Ke'ea, which means sovereignty endures. Um, Ea is the Hawaiian word that indicates sovereignty, and Mao is the Hawaiian word that indicates forever. Um, so I wanted to talk about Native Hawaiians and self determination and sovereignty. So a little bit of a roadmap. Um, really interesting that I came right after a, a talk that talked about apologies and reconciliation because I'm going to talk a little bit about that in our history. Um, a primary case in our history, um, the Rice v. Cayetano case, and then some. So what's happening on the self-determination that's in front for Native Hawaiians today. Um, in 1993, the U.S. Congress adopted and the president signed um, an apology resolution to the Native Hawaiian people for the U.S.'s participation in the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the lawful government of Hawaii. Um, oh, and even before I get to that, I wanted to say that Native Hawaiians, like many Native people, seek greater self-determination and greater control of their lands and natural resources. Um, there have been efforts on both the federal and state level, and there have been some additional resources provided to our community. Um, and currently, there is a growing acknowledgement by the United States, consistent with international law norms related to the rights of indigenous peoples, that Native Hawaiians are an indigenous people uh, with the right to self-determination. And then going back or on to the apology resolution, um, as I said, 100 years after the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, the U.S. apologized. And amongst the findings um, in that resolution is the recognition that the um, U.S. received from the puppet government, the Republic of Hawaii, about 1.8 million acres of land, the government and crown lands of the Hawaiian kingdom, without the consent of or compensation to the native Hawaiian people or their government. And subsequently, another whereas clause indicates that the indigenous Hawaiian people never directly relinquish their claims to their inherent sovereignty or over their national lands. Um, so this was a 1993 apology resolution, and one might ask, and then what happened? Um, and the truth is that, as I said, there have been efforts on a state level primarily our state has been much more receptive to reconciliation efforts than the federal government has. Um, 
So one of the things our state did in 1978, this was even before the apology resolution, was establish the Office of Hawaiian Affairs um, within, the, it's within the state constitution. Um, and part of that uh, was the idea of giving Native Hawaiians greater autonomy and the Native Hawaiians would elect nine trustees for the State Office of Hawaiian Affairs. They would receive a certain portion of revenue from the kingdom, national lands of the Hawaiian kingdom, the government and crown lands that were ceded to the United States and subsequently returned to the state of Hawaii. And it used those revenues in order to better the conditions of the Native Hawaiian people. So this was an effort by the state in 1978. It's a constitutional amendment it was adopted, passed by all the people of Hawaii, a majority of our voters. Um, and this was the, kind of the status quo until the year 2000, in which Harold Freddie Rice, this person right up here, who was a descendant of a missionary family, um, challenged the Hawaiians only voting restrictions for voting for OHA trustees. So up until that time, all Native Hawaiians of any percentage of Hawaiian ancestry oh, could vote for trustees of the Office of Hawaiian <laughs> Affairs. And these were the people involved. Ted Olson, who subsequently became Solicitor General, represented Harold Freddy Rice in the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, John Roberts, who subsequently became, as we all know, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, represented the state of Hawaii. And then this was our governor as well as the chair of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs at the time. Justice Kennedy wrote the majority decision. Basically, um, both the 14th Amendment, equal protection, as well as the 15th Amendment, voting rights had been raised. And the court did not address the 14th Amendment, but instead looked at the 15th Amendment. And the court basically said, this is a fundamental principle, states may not deny or abridge the right to vote on account of race. Um, the design of the 15th Amendment is to reaffirm the equality of races at the most basic level of the democratic process, the exercise of the voting franchise. The state had argued, and OHA had argued, that this was not a question of race, that um, Native Hawaiians were an indigenous people really deserve the kinds of protections that the tribes have with regard to um, laws that protect them and advance particularly self-government. Um, the court didn't buy that. And when, when the state made the analogy to Indians and Alaska Natives, the court basically said, in order to reach that conclusion, we would have to conclude that Congress has determined that Native Hawaiians have a status like that of Indians in organized tribes, and that it may and has delegated to the state of Hawaii a broad authority to preserve that status. These propositions would raise questions of considerable moment and difficulty, but we can stay far off that terrain. The state's argument fails more basically because these elections are elections for OHA trustees, they're elections of the state not of a semi-sovereign uh, entity, and they are elections to which the 15th Amendment applies. And so the court basically struck down um, the OHA voting regulation. And now in Hawaii, any, any resident and citizen can vote for the trustees of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Justice Breyer and Souter filed a concurring opinion, and basically they said, we don't see any particular trust relationship here uh, for Native Hawaiians. And we also think that OHA's electorate, which is anyone with Hawaiian ancestry, um, a descendant of someone in Hawaii prior to 1778, which was first contact with Captain Cook, um, could vote in the election. And they thought that was just too broad uh, a definition. It doesn't sufficiently resemble an Indian tribe. Two justices uh, dissented. Justice Stevens and Ginsburg basically felt the federal government had been afforded wide latitude in carrying out its obligations arising from the special relationship it has with Aboriginal peoples. And that includes Native Hawaiians whose lands are now part of the territory of the United States. 
So this was 2000, and as I said, since then, the, the elections for the trustees of the Office of Foreign Affairs now include all citizens of Hawaii. Um, the, there have been calls prior to 2000 for federal recognition for Native Hawaiians, but really with the advent of the Rice v. Cayetano case, that became, it became urgent, really. The concern being that since the court had indicated that Native Hawaiians were a race, that other programs that Native Hawaiians have, um, we have a wide array, array of federal and state programs that recognize Native Hawaiians as indigenous peoples, that those might be in jeopardy. And so Senator Daniel Akaka, who is now retired, uh, every year since then has advocated for uh, federal recognition in the congressional arena. That has not worked, especially in more recent years. Um, in 2011, the state of Hawaii enacted what's called um, Act 195. It's a, basically recognizes that Native Hawaiians are the only indigenous Aboriginal Maoli, which is the Hawaiian word for true genuine um, population of Hawaii, identifies Native Hawaiians as a distinctly Native community, and reaffirms that the state has had a special political and legal relationship with the Native Hawaiian people and has continuously enacted legislation for the betterment of their condition. And it established a five-member role commission. And the goal of the role commission, this is the signing ceremony. The goal of the role commission was basically an effort to register Native Hawaiians. Um, the definition for a Native Hawaiian here would be any person uh, of Hawaiian ancestry or and or, though it, it includes those who are Native Hawaiians defined under the 1921 Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, a federal act that established a homesteading program for Native Hawaiians of 50% or more Hawaiian ancestry. So there is a blood quantum in our community one that was imposed upon us by the federal government. Um, in addition, a Native, Hawaiian, a Native Hawaiian is defined as someone with a significant cultural, social, or civic connection to the Hawaiian community and 18 years of age or older. And then the idea was, would be that those on this role would be the base role for a Native Hawaiian government. Um, currently, there's a certified list of about 95,000 people um, who have been certified on the roll and approximately 28,000 people going through the certification process now. Um, statistically, you can see Native Hawaiians in the U.S. as of 2010, this is from the U.S. Census, there are 527,000 of us 55% of us live in Hawaii and 45% on the U.S. continent. So you might, in your head, think about whether 95,000, possibly with another 28,000, is a significant number of people to be involved in this process. Um, um, the next action that happened is that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs announced that it would facilitate the nation building process. OHA itself could not undertake that process because uh, the state was the state, the trustees, OHA was very concerned about the whole idea of state action. Right? Um, how involved could the state be in this process? So OHA said they would facilitate the process. Um, in, and remain neutral in the whole thing. Um, as a result, an organization called Na'io Puni, uh, which was a private entity with a volunteer board of directors um, who receives funding. Initially, actually, it's from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to this foundation. Uh, Na'io Puni is a nonprofit entity 
would serve as a, a fiscal sponsor for this whole effort. The sole purpose of Na'iel Puni is to help establish path for native for Hawaiian self-determination. So they're establishing an election process, a convention, and if the convention comes out with a governing document, then that would require a ratification process. So native Hawaiians, this is currently happening right now. Um, Na'iapuni is separate and independent from OHA. Their funding is primarily from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, but OHA has had no involvement in the election or the convention process. So, as I said, this is happening right now. Um, there was a mid-September deadline to file as a delegate candidate if you wanted to run. Um, the list of qualified delegates was uh, candidates was announced at the end of September. Over 200 candidates have filed papers to run as delegates. Um, but it, the, the distribution depends on where people live. So for the island of Oahu, which is our most uh, populated island, there will be 20 delegates. There are actually, I think, six or seven from the continental United States. Um, couple from each of our other islands, but the bulk of the delegates will come from Oahu. The voter registration closed, um, and then right now, beginning November 1st, we're in the process of voting for these delegates. And votes, it ends at the end of November. The convention will be held if it goes forward between February and April next year. Um, and then two months after that, if there is a, a, a governing document, there would be a ratification vote. And that's a big if. So you should know that within our community, this is a controversial process. There are many um, Hawaiians who think that independence is really the appropriate remedy for what happened in 1893 and the US involvement and the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And so some independent um, people are involved in the process. They say, we want to be there as a voice for independence at the convention. And others have decided not to participate at all. There has been a lawsuit filed to stop the process. Um, and actually, a motion for preliminary injunction was uh, heard last week, and a written order issued denying in the preliminary injunction. So that in, it, in and of itself is a big uh, process that's been going on. Um, that lawsuit raises 14th, 15th, and First Amendment claims, uh, Voting Rights Act, et cetera. Interestingly, the Department of Interior filed an amicus brief um, at that stage and basically supported the position of the state, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and the with the AHA moving forward. At the same time, as you all know, there is the process set up for acknowledgement of uh, Native American groups. It's long, complicated. We heard about it this morning. But the rules don't include indigenous groups outside the continental United States. One court characterized this as no Hawaiians need apply. So what's been happening most recently is the US Department of Interior last summer issued a proposed rulemaking process, a separate rule specifically to implement a government-to-government -government relationship with Native Hawaiians. And that um, engendered a lot of comments last year. It was an advance notice. Um, but in the ANPRM that DOI issued, they clearly acknowledged a special political and legal relationship between the federal government and the Native Hawaiian community. As I said, it was very contentious, independence uh, versus those who thought maybe federal recognition, some kind of relationship with the federal government might be an interim step to independence. And then more recently this year, the Department of Interior did propose a rule, um, recognizes the maintained inherent sovereignty of a reorganized Native Hawaiian government um, the organization of that government is largely left to the Native Hawaiian community. 
The rule allows recognition of only one government. All citizens of the government must be of Hawaiian ancestry. Um, there are certain protections in there for those who are beneficiaries of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act with that blood quantum requirement. Um, the governing documents must describe the membership, provide for periodic elections, guarantee civil rights protections similar to under the Indian Civil Rights Act, protect rights and benefits of those under the beneficiaries under the HHCA. No specific lands are involved, no change in jurisdiction over federal or state lands. IGRA, Indian Gaming Act, does not apply, no gaming. Indian programs and services are not automatically extended to Native Hawaiians. Um, and the rule would be implemented by the DOI Assistant Secretary of Policy, Management, and Budget, not under Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. So that's kind of interesting. It's also not going to be in 25 CFR. It's in um, 43 CFR. So, um, gosh, I have one minute left. So the, one of the things, and I think this might be the most controversial part of the proposed rule, is if a majority of voters and the DOI has estimated at 50,000, with at least 15,000 of those being eligible 50% or more Native Hawaiian ancestry, ratify the governing documents, then there is a broad, strong presumption of broad-based community support. If there's less than 30,000 affirmative votes, it would be reasonable to presume a lack of broad-based community support. Um, the rules are now under review and the Native Hawaiian community and others have until the end of, to the end of December to submit comments. Um, so I want to just say a little bit more about the UN Declaration because while it indeed does have this great language about the right to self-determination, there are also some provisions that Native Hawaiians find um, disturbing. Article 4, recognizes that indigenous people have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs. And there is no, uh, they wanted to make clear that nothing in the declaration authorized, obviously, or encouraged secession. And for those Native Hawaiians who seek independence, they look at this as a, um, as the human rights aspect um, they look at it with suspicion uh, because there are very much concerns that if Native Hawaiians choose to go uh, organizing a government, having a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States, will that preclude, preclude any claims under international law? Uh, we have to decide whether that government-to-government -government relationship with the U.S is the appropriate vehicle to express self-determination at this point in our history. Um, if we choose that path, will this be deemed acquiescence under international law and foreclose our claims stemming from the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom? Um, if this is a question of primary importance in our community now as it moves forward. So as you can tell, we're addressing some big questions in our community. I should tell you, many indigenous law scholars have advised us that they don't think going forward with a federal recognition government to government process would, in, would affect our claims uh, for independence. But that is still the major concern in our community. So thank you. Thank you very much.